Hey everyone, this is Brian and Shovik from Looking Glass, and today we're going to walk you through how we made this awesome piece in Unreal Engine from Cinema 4D. Now what's really cool about this right now at least is that we don't have a full Looking Glass plugin for Cinema 4D. So what this will allow you to do is take your scene and, ma and maintain most of the fidelity of it while also taking advantage of the Looking Glass integration we have in Unreal Engine. Um, so we're going to start off today with going through the actual Cinema 4D piece and sort of walking you through the design inspiration behind it, how we set this up, and then we'll move into uh, what we had to change to get things working in a real way we wanted to. Um, so Shovik, would you like to start us off today with uh, going through some of the design inspiration behind uh, this piece here? Yeah, sure. And let me just go into some of the backstory here. So we're both new employees, employees here at uh, Looking Glass Factory. So I have some skills and some experience with Cinema 4D, whereas Brian is highly skilled in Unreal Engine. So we wanted to solve a problem of bringing in Cinema 4D assets into our uh, camera viewing cone. And this is what we came up with. So initially, when, we, when I made the uh, scene here in Cinema 4D, wanted to um, continue with what's going on with design styles concerning vaporwave and retro art. So brought in some platonics here and uh, added a iridescent gradient to them to make like an abstract background. And then went over to Mixamo, uh, got a model from there, uh, added a breakdown uh, animation to it and just kind of configured the scene as you're seeing it here. Um, after that, we just, uh, packaged up the acid and sent it over to Brian, who set up the scene in Unreal. Yeah, so going from Cinema 4D to Unreal isn't super, super easy when you don't know what you're doing. So at first we were like, okay, let's just try importing the Cinema 4D file. And, you know, it didn't really work out as well. Um, and that's mostly because we didn't read the instructions. So if you're working with your Cinema 4D content and you wanted to bring it in, there's a few buttons you'll need to click. Uh, so first, in Cinema 4D, just go up to File. Uh, I'm going to move my little zoom window out of the way here quick. Oh, oh, so file. And then you're going to want to save project for Cineware. Now what this is going to do is it's going to take all of the special modifiers and everything you have in your Cinema 4D file and essentially bake them down to the raw meshes. And this will allow Unreal to be able to read that, right? Because if let's say you have a terrain object in Cinema 4D, Unreal doesn't know what that is. So this way it'll sort of convert it for to a, a Cinema 4D format that Unreal will be able to read. Um, and then from there, we can actually import that directly into Unreal Engine, which is pretty cool. So if we pop open Unreal over here, so we've got our Unreal scene, and what you can see here is that this is a little bit different from what we were just looking at. Um, you know, the, the triangles are a bit different, and while the gradients are the same, the look of it is, is, is a bit different from that viewport, right? So if we switch to unlit mode here, right, you can see that we've got um, the panning gradient here, and there's some you know, changes going on with the textures. So one of the things that's really cool uh, with Unreal Engine is the ability to go through and actually animate things live in the viewport, right? Because this is a real-time game engine. So that blew me away completely. Yeah. So so one of the things we took was this panning texture here, right? And we decided to animate it along this wireframe. Um, so one of the things we realized during this is that when we brought in the um, icosahedron shapes here, that these are actually all meshes, which is really bad, <laughs> right? <laughs> so if you're making a video game, don't do this. Um, you know, I did it. I totally did Shavik it. did it, but it's okay. You're making an art piece. Um, so if you're making a game, try to avoid this, and we'll show you a quick optimization trick that we did uh, to avoid this. But essentially what this means is that each one of these little stripes here is a polygon. And when you have really small ones like this, essentially you'll start getting an effect called overdraw, which means that this shape, even though it's only 100,000 vertices and 100,000 triangles, is actually much harder to render than a cube that had that much in it. And that's because those triangles are so small that eventually they're becoming, you're drawing multiple triangles per pixel, which will increase the render times and make your game run a bit slower. So what we did to make this a bit faster and a bit more fun to work on um, is we ended up building a shader, which I'll open up here. Right? So this is our wireframe material that allows us to take our gradient texture that we took for the main shapes and pan it, which is what this node did here, over time. 
node. So as time progresses for just this node, it will move the texture at a certain speed and then apply that to the base color of the object. So if, for example, we increase the speed here from one to three, yep, I did number pad there, let me switch to that. So we're gonna do three, hit apply, and what you'll start seeing is that now the texture is moving around much, much faster. Or if we were to do point one, for example, here, apply it there, you can see it's panning much slower. You can see that also taking effect directly in the background here, right? You can see the texture just panning very slowly down the shape here. Um, and the reason we did wireframe here is to replicate that same mesh effect that we had with that previous geometry, but without actually rendering all of those little tubes that we had in there. So you can do this. Uh, I'm just gonna full screen this here. And if you want to replicate this effect yourself, there's a few tricks you'll need to do. Uh, the first one is to scroll down a little bit in your details panel on the bottom left and click on the wireframe option. Uh, if I uncheck this, for example, you'll see that it will just be a normal sphere with a gradient on it. Uh, nothing special there. As soon as I turn on wireframe, you can see that we've got a really cool looking effect. Um, now, you may notice that our icosahedron shapes actually have triangles on them, right? So you can see this has, uh, it's definitely made of triangles, but then there's also squares, and you know, it's not as cool of a geometry as this, which has equilateral triangles on it. So this is due to the original mesh here, and you can see what we ended up doing was taking the original shape that we had in the file. So we've got two shapes here. We've got the original one, which has two materials on it for black and gradient. And then we've got the wireframe one that's rendering on top of that. So if I move this back there, you can see that's sort of how we get that layered effect. Um, and the reason we get the wireframe like this is because that's actually how the object was made. So if we go into wireframe mode, you can see it's just a bunch of triangles. Uh, I'm just gonna turn off or select this and move it over so we can see the triangles are better here and I'll, I'll move a bit closer so you can see the wireframe of the mesh actually consists of those triangles which is how we get that effect there so that all comes down to how you model it um, I'll move that back cool so we're all set there uh, there's also a ton more that we could have done with this effect we could have taken the second outer shell and like rotated that around and made a cool effect um, in our shader, we also built in displacement. So what we can do with that, if I open up the um, material instance here, which allows us to access a lot of these in sliders, you can see as I adjust the world position offset here, the sphere gets bigger. And what's really cool about that, we can also make it smaller. So this essentially allows you to animate the shape itself, which is very fun because you can essentially change the scale of it without modifying the scale properties. So this is this is a really fun way of, you know, we could have made it audio reactive. There's a lot more that you can do in Unreal Engine than what we've done here, but this is just the start of it. So I'm going to close that. Um, so and that was a really great idea because it, it really informs the movement of the piece. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think the like the more motion you can add to the pieces and the um, you know, more alive you can make them um, turn out, I think the, the better the piece will end up. Um, so, and that sort of comes into where we had our um, dancer here. So if I go ahead and click play in our sequence window here, you can see the dancer will actually start dancing, of course, as, as dancers do. And you can see they start <laughs> off and end in different positions. So this was something that, you know, will come down to framing your piece, right? So, of course, we can just put a hollow play capture in the scene here, like so, and position it. But that won't look great on our looking glass, right? Like, the person's not in focus. Um, and as we click play here, you can see that our, um, if I just re-enable the G key for um, viewing our game objects, you can see that, one, our hollow play capture actor is, like, in the floor. Um, and the person's really not in the center of them when they start dancing, right? So if we scrub through here, you can see at this point, they're actually completely outside of the volume, which means they won't be captured. So what Shovik and I ended up doing here, and I think Shovik, you can talk a bit more about, um, you know, the thought process behind framing the, the piece, um, is we ended up animating our holoplay capture 
uh, in sequencer here so that it follows the banter around and we can actually walk you through how to how to do this yeah we, we were kind of falling into a trap of like she is coming out, coming in and out of the frame so we thought why not have the camera follow her and it just gave the piece a more dynamic feel which you're seeing here right now right so if we want to track this ourselves just to go through a little mini tutorial here we're going to go ahead and click track actor to sequencer and add a hollow play capture actor to you can see here this makes an empty track so what we're going to do is we're going to go track and then transform that will give us the ability to track the location rotation and scale of it uh, you do not want to change the scale of a hollow play capture it will break it so just keep that in mind um, all of the scale keyframes here are all set to one so they, they, we don't care about those so what i'm going to do is uh, i've got it zoomed out so I can see the whole frame here. I'm going to take the transform keyframes. I'm just going to copy them from this actor, click on the transform track and paste. And you can see now that we have um, our location keyframes. And if we move it, you can see the hollow play capture actor moves with it. So one of the variables we do need to change here is the size to frame the content a bit better. So but you can see here it now moves along with it and the actor is always, or the dancer is always in focus here. So I'm gonna go ahead and adjust the size of the hollow play capture here. Like so, so it's 150. We found that 75 was really good for this scene. So now you can see the dancer is fully in focus here. We're lining our right up with the focal plane, which is a bit hard to see here. So I will um, actually make that a bit easier to see. I'm going to change the frustrum color to yellow and I'm going to increase the line thickness. Um, so you can see here, now I've defined that a bit better. So you can see that this yellow area here is where the actor or the dancer is in focus um, the most. So the further away you are from that focal plane and the closer you are to the, the starting of the clipping plane here, this is the near clipping plane, the more out of focus your actor will be. So it's, it's good to have most of your content focused on this plane and anything that sticks out a little bit or a little bit behind is where you really get that depth effect. So you, it's sort of a balance between sharpness and, and depthiness. Um, and you can see here, I'll make the blue outline a bit thicker as well. So that way we can see that a bit better. Um, and I will exit <laughs> full screen that again. Uh, I'm going to move the sequencer window over to my other monitor and then click play. We can really see how, of course, can't see yet. Um, now we can really see how this actor really goes through and uh, follows the dancer around as we keep in it. So what we were doing is we were playing through the sequence and moving the actor to a new position, saving that keyframe. Um, so that way each part or each keyframe specifically had the actor in focus. So that's sort of the, mm -hmm. the thought behind that. Um, so mini tutorial. Um, yeah, in now, case folks didn't catch all this information, Brian, where do you think they could find some more details? That's a good question, Shovik. So at Looking Glass, we've curated together a Learn Portal. This site has pretty much everything you need to know to get started with your Looking Glass, and we'll be adding more tutorials to that over time. So we're going to add a specific tutorial on animation in Unreal Engine. We're going to do some stuff in Unity. Uh, Blender, uh, pretty much all of the tools we support right now will have uh, guides and more advanced guides uh, moving forward. So we're super excited to, to experiment more with you all and really uh, take the holograms to the next level. So so look for the link below. Oh yeah, link below. Or who knows with YouTube, maybe it'll be on the side again. <laughs> And while we've got all these platforms on Learn, we also have something very exciting to tease here, is that we'll be supporting Unreal Engine 5 when it comes out later in the summer here. So just a little quick teaser here, is the new Unreal Engine 5 which just dropped in early access today. We've got our little hollow play capture actor there, so there's gonna be tons and tons of exciting content we'll be doing uh, with the newest version of Unreal, so we're super jazzed about that. So. So if y'all are looking to learn more, go check out our website at learn.lookingglassfactory.com or follow us on Twitter at LKGGlass. See you next time. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Bye, y'all. <laughs>